Alright you guys, welcome to the first installment of my first aid series that I'm going to do here. Um, today I wanted to go over uh, special considerations for CPR and for paddlers while we're out there on the river. Um, I have been in EMT for about nine years now. Um, four of those years I worked as the uh, one of the lead 911 trucks in my valley here. Um, and for the last three years I have worked as an ER tech at a uh, critical access trauma center here in northwestern Montana. Um, so unfortunately I have done a lot of CPR and uh, I was also a American Heart Association certified instructor there for a while. Um, so today I just kind of wanted to go over some things that um, you know we don't really go over in a regular um, American Heart Association class more so designed for paddlers and um, what we need to do differently or how we need to approach CPR as paddlers. Um, so let's go. So something that I wanted to say at the beginning of this video um, is to go take a CPR class. Um, find somewhere that will give you an American Heart Association card, um, somewhere to go get that class done. It's great knowledge. It is helpful in every situation in life. You can use it forever, um, and it doesn't really change too much. Um, and the reason I'm making this video is because I understand, you know, a lot of you out there probably have worked for a company at some point, you've probably made plans, you might have talked about these special considerations, but we do have a, a large group of people who have never been a guide before, never worked for a company before, but are still out on the rivers, still paddling a lot, and maybe haven't had or needed uh, to think about these kind of special considerations. So um, go find a class somewhere and uh, get that knowledge, but then also just kind of think about these steps that I'm going to give you today. Alright guys, so one of the first things I wanted to go over here um, with CPR is what not to do. Um, things that I fear might be happening out there that is actually not a good idea or bad. Um, it creates ineffective CPR. Um, the first one being um, PFDs. Uh, you cannot do effective CPR on a patient who is still wearing their life jacket. Um, what happens is there's too much foam, there's too much cushion in here, both on the back and in the front. So as you're giving your pushes, the foam is absorbing a lot of that energy and the chest isn't compressing as much as it should be. Um, and so you're going to come down to two different options here. You can either unzip it if it's a zip-up jacket, you can unclip it if it's a front clip jacket, um, or if it's one of these pullover astrals uh, like I wear, you can get to your knife really quick and pop the side uh, straps here and flip the jacket off. But we can't do CPR effectively on a patient who is still wearing their life jacket. Now that might also have something to do with uh, doing CPR on a raft. If you have somebody drown and you just get them back in the boat and you're continuing down the river trying to do CPR on the raft, it just doesn't work if you're just doing it on the tubes. Um, now if you have like a rowing frame with a bench seat on it, that's somewhere where you can uh, do some effective CPR if for some reason you need to keep moving down the river. But I advise if you ever have a drowning or if you ever have a heart attack that results in CPR, pull over to the side of the river, get the life jacket off, and start doing compressions. Alright, so now that we have the life jacket off of the patient, it is time to start CPR, right? Um, and a few years back, they decided that hands-only CPR is good enough um, to keep somebody alive, good enough to save them. They found out that people move a little bit of air um, anyways, so hands-only CPR is good enough, especially if you do not have a CPR pocket mask. Now. Um, that's one of the reasons why I say go find a class, go take a class, because most places when you take a CPR class will send you home with one of these um, face masks. Um, these cover the nose and the mouth, uh, create a good seal to help push air into the lungs. They come with a one-way valve on them, so you can blow into it and you don't have to worry about anything coming back at you if the patient were to vomit or spit up air or water or whatever. Um, so the one-way valve is awesome, and when you take that class, most places will give you this. If not, you can find them on some other websites like Boundtree. Um, this one is a Curaplex brand, but it uh, should be pretty easy online to find any CPR masks out there anywhere. Um, so, uh, these things are really nice. They go over like that. Um, it's pretty easy to use the strap, just put it over the patient's head like that. You can do your compressions. 30 and 2. Watch for chest rise and go back to 30 and 2. So 
So here's where things get really interesting uh, for us when it comes to doing CPR, where we will be doing CPR. Most rivers aren't out in the middle of town. Most rivers aren't in a super easily accessible place. Um, so at this point, once we've started CPR, we can't stop CPR. And we need to get help there as fast as we can. Most people, most drowning victims aren't going to come back um, without some extra care, um, defibrillation, uh, medications, intubation, that kind of stuff. Uh, so it is very imperative that at this point we get as much help as we can possibly get. So uh, here's my advice. Um, save two to three people with the patient to do CPR. CPR is extremely exhausting. Um, it is recommended that you trade out doing compressions every two minutes because it does get very tiring very quickly. It sucks being down here on the ground. It hurts your knees. It hurts your lower back. It wears you out. You'll be sweating. Um, it always makes me want to throw up whenever I do it just because of the constant bouncing motion, um, but so I advise keeping two to three people to stay with the patient and do CPR. Um, if you are in a place where there is no service and you need to send somebody out to go get service to be able to call for a helicopter or an ambulance, um, do so. Um, you might be able to call from where you're at. Uh, cell phones actually do have better service than you think. If you think you're in a location where you don't have any service and you can't get a regular phone call or a regular text out, um, 911 will work in some cases in some of those remote locations where regular service doesn't actually exist. Um, but, so that's my advice. Um, figure out exactly where you are, and I also advise having exit plans and exit strategies ahead of time um, for this kind of exact situation. Know the rapids that you're going into ahead of time. Know the ones that might give you a, a bigger problem, and have a plan on how to get out. Um, have a plan on being able to tell where Tell your first responders, tell your rescuers where you are so that they can come in and help you. Um, because you're going to be doing CPR for a long time at this point. Um, so that's one of those things to just prepare for. You're going to be in it for the long haul. Um, as I said before, with a, a rowing frame on a raft, if you can do CPR on a rowing frame on a raft, um, if you need to float out to be able to get better access for the patient, do so. Um, but that's probably not going to be the best option. There's probably more rapids in the river. Um, it's going to be impossible to do CPR going through rapids. Um, best thing would be to find a clearing, somewhere for a helicopter to land, um, maybe bring a beacon um, that they can use with you. Um, stuff like that. Just be prepared for the long haul when it comes to that. And trade out every two minutes. Make sure you're getting plenty of rest. If you have um, water or Gatorade with you, you know, be consuming some of that in your break time. Um, and just be ready for that as well. So one more situation I wanted to go over for uh, people who have uh, drowned, maybe haven't been under that long, um, let's say that their heart is still beating, um, but their lungs are full of water at this point, um, and they're just not breathing. Uh, we're going to initiate CPR the same, um, because we don't have an advanced airway that we can give, we don't have anything that we can do to try to get that water out of their lungs, so we're going to start pumping um, and try to work some of that water out, and hopefully their heart will continue to beat until they expel some of that water. So. Um, you guys have seen it in movies before, someone who's drowned, start doing CPR, they come back, they cough up a bunch of water. Um, if that happens, what you want to do is you want to remove your face mask um, and you want to roll them onto their side. Uh, this is what we call the recovery position. And what it does is when somebody is on their side, um, it lets that water come out of their mouth, it lets that, that um, air, saliva, they might vomit at that moment um, too but it lets all of that come out of their mouth right there. Um, instead of, if they're on their back still, it'll come out and go back into their airway, which is terrible. Um, this is cool and exciting if they come back right away, um, but you're not out of the woods yet. That is, um, this patient is going to be out of it right off the bat um, because their brain is gonna be lacking oxygen because it's been living off of the oxygen stored in the body for the last minute or two um, or five, however long it's been. So they're gonna be out of it right off the bat. They're not gonna be acting right. They're going to be having a really hard time breathing. Um, over the next few minutes, hopefully, they should come back to it a little bit better. Um, the more oxygen they get in their system, the more they come back, the better they'll feel. But this patient is not out of the woods, and you need to call for immediate evac in this situation. Um, getting water in your lungs, even clean, nice water, um, has bacteria in it. And that bacteria going down in your lungs, just having anything in your lungs that isn't supposed to be there, can give you aspiration pneumonia. Um, and it can kill you pretty quickly. So if this happens, if you're on a trip, you're on day one of a three-day trip or whatever, 
this happens, and that person says, oh, no, I'm fine, I don't want to go make them. This person needs to get to a hospital right away, and they need to get watched, where medical help can actually help them if they do develop that aspiration pneumonia. So I think that we all can agree that uh, drowning is hands down the worst thing that can happen in our sport. Uh, whether you're a kayaker, whether you're a rafter, um, the one thing that none of us ever want to see, and none of us ever want to be a part of is a drowning. Um, so the best thing that we can do is get that knowledge and be prepared um, for if it does happen. Uh, like I said, go take one of those classes, get a pocket mask, um, get some training. If you want to go above and beyond, go find an EMT class out there to take. Um, I have found it has helped me uh, all the time, not just at work. Um, I took it a step above. I'm an advanced EMT now, um, so I do have a little bit further knowledge in there. But um, experience, time on the water, and just having that education out there and having people who know what they're doing um, on the river with you or being that person who has that education to help others, um, it's, it's invaluable. You, you can't put a price on it. Um, you really shouldn't be doing this out there unless you have at least some grasp on uh, CPR. So uh, go out there, get that training. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helped. Um, if you guys have any questions on this stuff, please uh, drop a question down below. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, thank you for watching. Until next time.